All right, welcome to the November 2012 edition of Bali's Community Capital Webinar Series. My name is Alyssa Baron Mensa, and I serve as Managing Director at Bali. We have local economy leaders from across North America registered for today's webinar, and we're delighted to have you with us. So I'm going to review a bit of housekeeping, provide a few reminders about this series, and then we'll introduce our topic and speaker, Stephanie, for today. So if you're dialed in by phone, but you've not joined us in the webinar room, you can find a link in your reminder email from Ali Walker. Because of the number of webinar participants, we have the phone line muted. So if you have a question for Stephanie at any time during the webinar, you can type your question in the public chat window. She might answer a question during her presentation, but we'll hold most questions to the end of the webinar when we have time set aside for moderated Q&A. If you have technical difficulties at any point, we have a slightly different process today for, uh, than usual for folks who often join these webinars. If you're having trouble today, you can note that in the chat window along with your email address, and our staff member, Allie, will email you offline to help you get your tech difficulty worked out. After each webinar, we'll email everyone registered a link to a full recording of the webinar along with presentation slides and a copy of the questions from the chat window. So you can watch for those in an email from Allie over the next couple of days. So now a bit more about our series. Uh, this series launched in early 2011, and we're delighted to be continuing it throughout 2012 and into 2013. Uh, these Community Capital webinars are held the second Tuesday of every month at this time, 10 a.m. Pacific. The series is co-hosted with us by RSF Social Finance with advising from a wonderful group of community capital pioneers that are listed on our website and with underwriting support from RSF Social Finance, Portfolio 21 Investments, Main Street Resources, and the Solidago Foundation. So our intention for these webinars is for them to be focused on tools you can take home and try out right away. So each month we feature a case study with a community capital innovator, someone who's developed and piloted a working model for connecting local people's investments and businesses and farms to local needs using local resources. The innovators present their model and we have time for dialogue and questions. And we suggest you treat these calls as an opportunity to bring together a group of business owners, social entrepreneurs, lenders, philanthropists, investors, anyone in your community who's interested in the topic. After listening to the webinar, you can spend some time discussing with your group the applicability and relevancy to your community. We encourage these kinds of roundtables so you don't have to pay extra per attendee on the same webinar line. Next month, we're going to be featuring Invest Local Ohio. It's a revolving loan fund that supports local businesses through unaccredited investors. So this is a, a revolving loan fund based in Columbus, and it works with all sorts of regular average Joe investors who are investing small amounts of money. And through that revolving loan fund, they're actually supporting uh, underserved, low and moderate income individuals and businesses who traditionally lack access to capital, uh, along with a whole suite of small business development services. And and um, the, the group that's piloting this work, Economic and Community Development Institute, is a CDFI, and they are actually one of the co-founders of the Bali Network in Columbus, Ohio. So we we'll hope you'll join us next month um, and for the rest of our series in 2013. And you can find out more information about upcoming webinars and link to registration on our website, balocalist.org. So today we're very excited to be uh, with Stephanie Rerick, who's founder and director of the Dane County Time Bank and the former board chair, uh, co-chair of Time Banks USA. So Stephanie is very uh, deep with her Time Bank in Madison, Wisconsin, founded it in 2005 and continues to serve as its director. Uh, she's also really been working nationally and internationally to advance um, Time Banks as a tool for community development. So um, we're excited to be in conversation today about how time banks are, are growing in popularity, but they're also growing in their impact and offering yet another option to the traditional currency system in connecting folks with skills and folks with needs um, and, and building out those connections as a part of a robust local living economy. So with that, Stephanie, I am going to uh, pull up your presentation and it's pulling up right now. Let's see here. And then I'm going to turn control over to you to take us away. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And um, as you probably all know and have heard on different webinars, it is definitely a different kind of situation to be talking and not be able to see or hear you. And um, 
I would like to welcome you. Anytime you have a question or anything, um, comment, just type it in the chat window and I'll pay some attention and then Allie will also help me go through and, and um, get to those later. So um, I'm just going to jump in and tell you some things about time banking and um, I should be done talking by 12.30 uh, my time, 10.30 Pacific and then and we'll take questions. So starting in on time banking, we are referring it to it as do it ourselves, economic justice and community resilience, recognizing that an economy is much larger and uh, more dynamic than how we tend to think of it as, as just being locked into our actual money system that we're used to, um, that the economy is actually something we do. And uh, if we understand better the different moving parts in an economy, we can apply different kinds of tools to create a, a more sustainable, healthy situation. And um, I like to ask people these couple questions. And I would like you to just take a moment and think of the answer to this question. What would you do to improve your community if you could? So just think about the first answer that comes to mind, the things that you read about in the newspaper that you tend to complain about um, that happen in your neighborhood or things that you wish were different. Um, and, and think about what you would do to make them different. Often people have ideas here. Now think about the second question. Um, if you were to write down the answer to your first question and then see the second question, what if money were no object? Would those answers be different? Um, so for some people they are different, for some people they're not. And I often have people read out their answers here and um, you know, sometimes people will say you know, the exact same thing for both. But a very common um, set of answers would be uh, one, one time I asked people these questions and the person who chose to share said um, with the first question what she would do to improve her community if she could, she had written down build a homeless shelter. And then with the second question, what if money were no object, she wrote provide housing for everyone. But wait, is money an object? So um, an object is a material thing that can be seen and touched. And as we know from our experience, money is any kind of medium that can be exchanged for goods and services used as a measure of their values. Um, and as we know, most of the money that we exchange now isn't paper, coin, money. A lot of um, exchanges happen virtually. And then um, in our Overall economy, I think over 98% of transactions are actually speculative. So we really money has become less and less of a tangible thing over time. Um, and now we have all kinds of flexibility in things we use as money. Um, one example that people don't often think of that is becoming more and more used as currency is frequent flyer miles. Um, it's increasingly true. I know in, in, in uh, Europe in some places you can use frequent flyer points for groceries. Um, so there are a lot of different models um, that are used to build an economy, and there are a lot of different tools. So here's an anecdote that is from one of my very favorite books called The Future of Money by Bernard Lee Taylor. And that book is actually what, got, what helped develop my understanding of um, our economy, how it works, and how it could be different. And the anecdote is, say, a Martian landed in a random neighborhood in a city in the United States. And this Martian, Martian happens to have landed in a neighborhood in Detroit that you can find a scene like this in most American cities, or many cities around the world. And the Martian sees litter on the ground and crumbling infrastructure and kids with nothing to do after school and people with disabilities who don't have the care that they need and can't get out and about. Um, and the list goes on and on. Um, and at the same time, the Martian learns that there are people sitting in their homes in that very same neighborhood, underemployed, unemployed, working some jobs that they don't care about at all, not tapping into the things that they want to do. And then the Martian also learns that we know exactly what to do about all the problems that the Martian had seen earlier. And then asks what we're waiting for. And someone explains, well, we're waiting for money. What's money? And money is an agreement to exchange something for goods and services. Um, and then the Martian leaves and uh, sees that we keep waiting for this thing to connect the people in the work. And then the Martian would realize if there, or wonder if there was intelligent life on the planet. So one of the things that, that we have learned through learning about different models like time banking, um, and I'll go into the nuts and bolts of time banking in a moment, but time banking is a mutual credit system, meaning that we 
um, get together in a network of people, businesses, organizations, and we choose to extend credit to each other. Um, and we pool our time and talents and we uh, exchange them directly with each other. And the notion is that you can build a flourishing community economy that thrives alongside and overlaps the market economy without being completely dependent on it. So as things work today, um, our economic activity pretty much centers in the market economy and then through involuntary contributions like taxes and voluntary contributions like philanthropy, we get a little tiny stream of money that comes to fill our community functions and it's always insufficient. Um, and we end up often being pitted against each other. Um, a lot of organizations, businesses, individuals with very common goals end up fighting each other for crumbs um, for, for scarce money when in reality we could, be, uh, we could be collaborating and cooperating to build more abundance. In other words, we have what we need if we use what we have. And this is a quote by the man Edgar Kahn, who's a lawyer from Washington, D.C., who really um, helped to develop the system around time banking and helped to popularize time banking, although this kind of exchange of time and talents has been going on throughout human history, but we'll talk about it in its current form now. So what is time banking? It's very simple. You give and you get. And um, when I help someone else in the time bank, I get a credit in my account for the exact amount of time I spent helping them. So if I teach two piano lessons for an hour each, I have accumulated two hours in my account. There's no money equivalent. It's just an hour. Um, and I can't negotiate. I can't say that I am great at teaching piano, so my hour is worth two hours. Everyone's time is valued equally in time banking, and that's a very important component. And I'll expand on that a little bit more later. But um, essentially, time banking is you put in your time, and you take out time from other people in the network. Um, and it's very flexible and fluid. So I can spend my time before I earn my time. If I join the time bank because I need help moving, I can get that help moving for five hours tomorrow. Then I owe five hours back to my community who I can provide services to any, anyone at any time who is part of the time bank. And time banking is based on five core values. So the first of those values is assets, um, meaning everybody has something to give. Um, whether it's sharing a book or music collection or walking someone's dog or phoning someone to check in on them because they're homebound and we need to make sure that they're cared for properly, um, or, or whether it's building a computer or teaching a language or teaching an instrument. Um, everyone's assets are valued and everyone has something to give. The second core value is reciprocity, that we all do better um, if we give and receive. And um, this also ties in with another term that we tend to use a lot in time banking, which is co-production. And basically, the way I interpret that is, um, is that our society is diminished by dividing us into classes of separate classes of givers and receivers, or people who serve and those who are served, um, and that we all benefit from giving and receiving. And, and I find this, in my experience, to be particularly true for people who have ended up being on the receiving end of human services for a lot of their lives, people who might have a mental health diagnosis or who might have a disability, or um, for some other reason has gotten into the human service system, it's, it's, it's very common for people to get really identified with their needs and their deficits and to really internalize that. And I'm sure many of you know people in this situation or people who have been chronically unemployed, that people really get focused on what it is that they don't have. And, um, and it can become a very unhealthy place. And in time banking, by receiving, um, help from others, we give them the gift of being able to give, and that's something that I think is really key. Third core value is redefining work, and essentially that means that all work is valuable. Some work is beyond price. And for me, here's where um, the breaking down and removing the money equivalent and the negotiability from time, from, from our time exchange is really important. Um, it's until you actually participate in an economy as equals, you don't really, or in my experience, you don't really realize how foreign it's been to your experience. And there's something really um, valuable to that. And then an example for me personally, I give piano lessons. And a lot of times I, give, I just give piano lessons to kids of friends. 
And it was a real struggle for me to price how I did piano lessons because I would like to charge a very high rate because it's difficult for me to make a commitment to be at the same time and place every week with my other schedule. But at the same time, since it's kids of my friends, I would like to charge a really low rate because I want to help them out. Um, so that was always a struggle for me. But in time banking, I just charge an hour for my time. The kid can earn an hour however they like, and then it gives them a different sense of value of the lesson because it's something they have to earn. Or the parent can earn it on behalf of the kid, but it breaks down that strangeness of trying to put a price on your time. And um, one thing, I've been active in other kinds of complementary currency models, and, uh, and I've found that it's much more comfortable for a lot of people when we're getting into the realm of caregiving and creativity and civic engagement and community building. It feels much more natural to not put a price on that stuff. And that there are all different ways of looking at this, and we can talk more about it during the discussion. So the fourth core value is community, that we do better in a network. Um, we used to refer to this as social capital, and they are different pieces of a, of a similar idea that networks of communities are more powerful than us individually. Um, and then the fifth core value is respect, that everyone deserves respect from civic institutions and other individuals. So the way time banking works is people join and um, what we do is we get uh, we use some web-based software. I'll show you a screenshot of some of it in a, in a moment. But um, so the, there are several steps to starting a time bank. But the very first step is to identify your potential partners, and we'll get into that in a couple in, after a couple slides. But you need to know who in the community um, you'll be working with or are likely to be working with, and set an overall goal. You need to know why you are starting a time bank. So a lot of people start a time bank to build community in their neighborhood, and that's a great reason to start a time bank. Um, a lot of people choose to start time banking to focus in on meeting one particular need, and I'll talk about a couple of those approaches soon. Um, but the slide that you're looking at, you're just seeing a page of, from our time bank application. So we give this out to people when they fill out a paper application or we sit down with them at a computer. and. Um, the categories on here, you'll see they include transportation, help at home, companionship, recreation, wellness, community activities, business services, home repair, education, arts, crafts, and music. Um, and then there's a miscellaneous section too. So people can offer a request anything at all that they want to offer a request. And then um, we enter that stuff into our online database. Um, there are several different options of software that you can use. So, um, and then this is actually a screenshot of my account from the time that I, that I did this. So this was in March. And these are some of the services I've provided and received. So it just gives you a little taste of, of what happens. But I was teaching driving lessons to a young man. Um, I helped an older woman write her life story. Um, I got some graphic design help laying out the artwork for a CD of mine. I've sold some CDs in exchange for that. I've gotten cooking, sewing, um, massage, picture framing. So just to give you a sense of the kinds of things that, that um, get exchanged. And then these exchanges, we just went, I went online into Community Weaver 2. So that's time banking software provided by Time Banks USA. Um, and it's one of many different options. But what I did after I provided the service is I just logged into my account. I wrote the member that I provided the service for, the service I provided, and the amount of time I spent. Then it automatically shifts the hours from their account into mine and sends them an email letting them know. So um, people sometimes say, oh, can't you game the system? Can people take more hours than they spend? Not really, because when you take hours, they come from someone else's account and that person is notified. Even if that person doesn't catch the mistake until a year later, it's totally fixable within the system. Um, but we don't tend to have that problem, and time banks don't tend to have that problem. Part of it is there's no anonymity at all in the system, and we do a lot of stuff to bring people together face-to-face -to, -face to really build the community connections and build accountability toward each other. Um, and also, for us, it's really important to make all our decisions based on the core values of time banking. So we pay time bank hours for all the work that gets done on behalf of the time bank. And um, 
and we just really encourage people to connect and, and meet the needs that need to be met. So that's why we have very flexible policies about you can spend hours before you earn hours. We have very loose debit limits which just indicate that we um, that when someone if someone's spending a lot of hours and not earning any, then we contact them and help them find ways to earn. But we generally just find that if people need a lot of help, it's important for us to make sure that they get that help that they need um, and they can repay as, as they're able to. So we use Community Weaver 2 software and that's provided by TimeBanks USA and you can learn more about that at TimeBanks.org. There's also some free software called Our World. There's also some other open source models. And, um, and I, I'm not going to recommend a particular software. I'll just say what we use. And, and um, we're actually in the midst of, of a large process nationally and internationally to really pull our resources together and publish them in, in one place so you'd be able to see at a glance what your options are. And that's in progress. So unfortunately, I can't point you to that right away, but I should be able to point you to that within a month. Um, and I'll point you to some other resources where you can stay up to date. So we view time banking as a way that we can pool our resources and um, uh, connect with people with similar goals, um, give people a chance to earn something meaningful toward their living while doing what they care about. So no one's earning their entire living with, uh, with uh, time banking, but hopefully someday we will build our capacity for people to be more, meet more and more of their needs, but it certainly can um, have, an, have a very positive impact on your quality of life and, and helping you with your budget. Um, time making can also help pool resources and mobilize people toward a common goal, and I'm going to focus in on that now. Um, so this uh, slide shows you sort of a rough overall view of our long-term vision that we set out at the very beginning of the Dane County Time Bank. And you can see this much more fleshed out at our website. So I'll give you all those links. You can access all this stuff later. Um, so we identified different segments of our community that we thought could connect more effectively if we had time banking as a system to promote collaboration and resource exchange. So you'll see social services, for example, our Dane County Department of Human Services um, gives us almost $60,000 a year from their developmental disabilities budget because they see us as a very effective way to help integrate people with disabilities more effectively in the community. One example is we have an older gentleman with a disability who loves to play cribbage and he pays people time bank hours to come play cribbage with him and he also earns time bank hours teaching other people to play cribbage. And that's an awesome way to use the time bank and that this enables his staff to get a break and not always do the things that he's wanting to. It enables him to expand his social circle. It gives him a chance to give from what he has to offer and his skills. Um, so that's one example. Um, another example is an agency joining forces for families has gotten time date members to come help them pr help prepare a mailing um, where they were advocating for people to come out and help protect their funding. So not only do they help get the mailing done, but the people who are connecting with them to do the mailing are suddenly more connected with the organization. Local business, since we're um, a business-oriented group, I'll just touch on this a little bit. Time banking is good for the, for the margins of local businesses. Because time banking doesn't have a monetary equivalent and is not considered taxable, you can't just take time bank hours in your till. Um, that's not good for time banking or for businesses. What you can do is use stuff at the margins. So for example, I have a coffee house. And um, we've gotten a lot of help with painting and gardening and stuff like that at the coffee house. And I pay that stuff out of my personal account. But another thing that we could do is sell a discount card or um, something like that for our coffee house. So what you need to do is avoid giving a monetary equivalent um, to time banking, but you can use excess capacity and match it to things that you wouldn't normally be able to do for your business. So. Um, so many of the things with businesses and organizations, um, so many of the marketing tools are really person-to-person, low-tech. Um, one example is put posting flyers or um, passing out handbells or putting handbells in public places for events. Another example is um, for organizing events, uh, you can always increase your turnout a whole lot by phoning people with reminders. 
those kinds of little actions that require a lot of time and not a lot of skill um, are really hard to get around to, and you you know it's hard to choose to devote staff time or other resources to those, to those things. Those are the perfect kinds of opportunities in a time bank. Um, so um, I'm going to just uh, leave this at that, and we can go into it more. I just don't want to take so much of your time before we go to questions. Um, so now I'm going to talk about how we use time making to pool our resources to carry out projects. So this is this is partly why I refer to knowing why you want to start your time bank um, in order to be able to shape it properly. Um, so we started our time making knowing we wanted to create this opportunity for connection among these different sectors. We also had a very specific focus on community justice um, because our community locks up a lot of people of color and our country locks up a lot of people overall. And we wanted to help use the time bank to change that. So we had recognized that all these things that contribute to community accountability and public safety and healthy communities and healthy kids and adults staying out of trouble, they're all community based. They're not things the police can do for us. So they're not things the city attorney or district attorney's office can do for us. We need to have healthy intact communities with good social opportunities, economic, educational, recreational opportunities. So we thought the time bank would be a great way to start to accomplish that. So we set up our time bank with the goal of having a time bank youth court within a year. And we um, we, rep, we uh, took the model that was being used in Washington, D.C., where they had a time bank youth court, and we decided to expand on it. And that's what we do a lot in time banking, and, and all kinds of, you know, everybody does it with all kinds of efforts. But we build on each other's work and adapt it and then share back what we've done. So what we do is um, kids who get into trouble come to a jury of their peers. That whole jury is earning time bank hours for their time. Um, our youth courts are not housed in schools, so if the jurors choose not to be individual participants in the time bank, the school gets their hours. Um, the kids who've gotten into trouble then get sentenced to things that address the problems they're having, so they might have to take a nonviolent communication class, um, and then also address um, strengths and interests. So we really try to get them plugged into some things, some positive activities in their community. Then time bank members help them carry out their, their sentences. So instead of going before a judge and talking about why they should or shouldn't pay a certain amount of money, they're connecting with people in their neighborhood who are now developing a relationship and paying attention to how they're doing. And while we're diverting kids from the just formal justice system, we're helping rebuild the neighborhoods that are really what can take care of kids. So that's one example. Other examples were a partner in Ally Community Co-op where we actually have a store in the Ally Drive neighborhood and people can access donated goods for their time bank hours. So they're paying time, they take the goods, and the, the time goes to pay people to staff the store. Um, our wellness project, we have a group of people who are working on building up health and wellness resources in the time bank. Right now they're serving a month, they're doing a monthly meal and workshop where they serve some healthy food and do a workshop about some form of self-care. So we just had a self-acupressure workshop. We have an EFT workshop coming up. We have Feldenkrais. Um, we have blood pressure checks, blood sugar checks. We're going to start some time bank um, clinics in a few neighborhoods. So um, those are just some of the things that, that we're working on, and that's how we carry out projects. So um, this next slide shows some of the ways that people exchange uh, time bank hours. And just a quick apology for the formatting. Things get weird when I um, convert to PowerPoint, so sorry about that. But, um, but these are from our annual reports, and you're welcome to download these at our website, DaneCountyTimeBank.org. But most of the hours exchanged here are in community activities. And what that means is there are a lot of organizations having people help out, help organize activities and do stuff for the organizations. And um, same, the business services covers that too. So we have um, organizations. We have a, actually the, the businesses that use the time make most tend to be a couple martial arts centers because it's really easy to see where you can offer classes and then people get admin help and help with cleaning and stuff like that. And then for individual services, help at home, um, light housekeeping, wellness stuff, companionship, education, transportation, home repair. Oh, one thing that I should mention too is we just got some funding through. Um, the Federal Transportation Administration to help uh, to have time bank members provide rides 
for rural patients who need kidney dialysis. So these are folks who have to go about 30 miles each way three times a week and spend four to five hours at the dialysis center. So we're, we've been able to link them with time make members who can help them with transportation. So just another example of a very directed application. And then, um, and then this slide just shows a list of our different projects. So I've mentioned a number of them. I'm going to go a little bit more into um, a, one other project just because I want to give you some context and I'm just about to wrap up this part. Um, and then we'll get to the real nuts and bolts stuff about background checks and challenges. The way we have come to see time banking, so this slide is from my project called Time for the World, and that's really about helping to promote time banking and also understand its context within our economy and within our community and understand it well enough that we can make it all work much better. So our time bank's been around since 2005, October 2005. We have over 2,000 members. We have about 130 organizations and people have exchanged more than 60,000 hours of service since we've been around. And we estimate that that's probably, people probably record about a third of what they actually do within the time bank. And we're just estimate that anecdotally because, or anecdotally because, um, because we know of so many people who don't record their hours. Um, but we started to view this as, um, view our economy as the different levels in a food chain in an ecosystem. So barter and gift economies and time, we think of as the part of the economy that's, that's um, taking advantage of infinitely abundant resources. And I mean infinitely abundant, caregiving, creativity, civic engagement, community building. And, and so we're actually very interested in how you could use that to really pull your resources, make visible the value in your community, and start to, um, and start to really pull that and then develop sort of more refined or go up the food chain kinds of kinds of currencies. So um, so the sunlight part the photosynthesis of time making can take a lot of a lot of the natural resources in a community and use those to build up other economic development opportunities. Then we're looking to connect we, we think that time banking's real power might be unleashed much better and the power of other economic tools when we combine them in um, sort of a loose uh, sort of a loose package of tools. And that's something that we're working toward here. And that's why I mentioned it. That's our healthy community economy project. So for us, the next step is to explore how we can link time banking and then a similar system, which would also be mutual credit that have prices attached to it and would be taxable. So businesses can exchange through mutual credit. Um, and be loosely linked in with the time bank. And then also build additional tools um, like a community banking tool, um, kind of similar to, to what you were mentioning at the beginning about um, the investor circle in, in, in Ohio, only even maybe more informal and it's individual, um, individual people saving their money in a way that gives them the opportunity to give no interest loans to each other and fund some community efforts. And along with cooperative ownership to, to leverage higher levels of resources. So um, we learn by doing through trial and error. And a lot of our work is about really getting people to share what it is they're doing, improve on it, build it, share it back. In order to do that, we've made a platform called Build for the World, buildstw.org. And again, I'll send you links to all this. Um, and here's where you can find different community problem solving projects using different kinds of cooperative tools. And then we'll be building in more data evaluation and sharing so we can really learn what works best under what local conditions. Um, the way I see it is this, we are babies in this cooperative economic movement. And there's a lot of room for innovation and there's tons of room for improvement. And the more we communicate, the more we'll do that. And we'll make new friends in the process. So we all know ways we want our world to be better. What are we waiting for? And now we'll take questions. I can um, uh, I actually I'll let uh, let you facilitate or um, suggest how you want to group the questions if you want to. Otherwise, I'll just start. Sure. Thank you, Stephanie. You um, are more adept at following the questions as they come in, I think, than um, some of us may be in speaking and reading at the same time. Um, I'd love to go back to a question um, that was asked early in your presentation that I think is foundational to all the questions that come next, um, which is, 
what are the key initial steps involved in launching a community time bank? So you mentioned really getting clear about why a time yeah. bank is needed and what you want it to accomplish, and you know, starting to think about what assets you've got and kind of mapping assets. But could you walk through that in a little more detail? Yes. And actually, let me just share on our website. Um, I'm going to type it in right now, DaneCountyTimeBank.org. Um, you can find, I made a little new time bank timeline. It's, it's really not pretty. It's super basic, but it just says exactly what we did. So what we did first was, um, well, I went and started talking to people. I started with my mayor and county executives because I already had a relationship with them, and I was hoping the county executive would take this on. I actually wasn't looking for a job. But I'm happy I got this job. It's very rewarding. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, you want to identify a couple of your partners who are committed to working on it, and that will shape where it goes. And then you need to sit down and, and think through what you want to accomplish and who needs to be involved, like roughly who needs to be involved. And then um, start holding a couple meetings uh, you know, where you just invite the people you know need to be involved. And then each meeting you're just making a list and seeing who else needs to be there. And then at a certain point, I would say five to ten people is a good core group. Um, there's training available, and you can access that right now through timebanks.org, and you can also be paying attention to DaneCountyTimebank.org website for that information. Because again, that's part of a uh, uh, big project we're working on is just really pulling together all the available resources so you can look at one website and find them, at which, and that's not the case yet. But I'll give you a few websites where you can find the different pieces. So I really recommend that people get a training because it's really helpful to get your course. So what we did was we had uh, we formed a little steering committee. Then we had um, a few informational meetings. Then we raised money and brought some trainers to do a two-day training for us. Um, once we had a core group and we felt ready to launch, um, and there are a lot of different possibilities for that. And there's a lot more resources now than when we started. So there's there are more web based resources and um, more decentralized training resources now. So, um, and then yeah, there are just a few basic policies that I think you need to figure out, which are what kind of application process do you have, are you interviewing members, you're doing orientations, um, and then I think that the biggest stuff you need to figure out is are you going to do background checks and what does that look like. Um, I do so, so, and then I would say the next step is to pick your time banking software and start. Um, for us, we spent about a year planning, um, and I would have, I, in retrospect, I would cut it to six months for our own process because I think we answered the essential questions by six months in, but then spent a lot of time just like second guessing everything and. Um, and trying to anticipate every possible problem and kind of overthinking things and confusing ourselves, which is easy to do. Um, and once you start, it's actually more straightforward than what you keep thinking it's going to be when you're planning. So that, that's my personal experience. Um, with background checks, we do a very basic free online background check. Um, so we do the Wisconsin Circuit Court check and the National Sex Offender Registry check. We have some organizations that we work with that require higher level background checks than that for the people they're going to work with. So um, we have a question on our application form, and we also have asked in broadcast emails who's willing to have this higher level background check in order to work with these organizations. And so they have, so the organization will have a smaller pool to draw from, but then when they make a match, they'll do that background check so they know that the person's had it. That way we don't have to manage any social security numbers. We don't pay for background checks or do any of that um, for, the, for the higher level one. So that's how that works right now. And um, just briefly, and if, if it were up to me, I don't know how it will play out with our whole time bank because it's up to many more people than just me. If it were up to me, I would choose not to do any background check for our part of it and just have it either either the people have had this higher level background check or they have had no background check because I worry that people get some false sense of security. Um, I, I, just, I just don't think a background check is the level that we do is all that reliable anyway. 
um, if people can do something terrible and or if people can be falsely convicted of something terrible or people can do terrible things and never be caught. And um, I think in general, the building trust, reducing anonymity, creating community accountability go much farther. And I think that it's good for people to know. I, I think it would be good for people to know no background checks been done and you can do one if you'd like. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. And it comes up all the time. That's why I mention it. Is that helpful enough, or did I skip any of the key things that you're thinking? No, of I think it's I starting? think it's very helpful, and I think we've had a, a conversation, a couple of us trying to find this time bank timeline to follow along oh. with you, and we've located it on the on your website, dankennytimebank.org, under Tools for Members. There's a pull down Tools for Organizers, and then I pulled up that website here. And then towards the bottom right of the screen, it says, just getting started. Here's how we did it. New time bank timeline. I can't pull it up here to show everyone because it's a Word document, and I, I can't get that to load. Um, but this is where everyone is to um, find it in the future. And anything else you would say um, you know, along the lines of you know, following along with these steps and, and kind of resources for folks getting started about the other resources you've got assembled here? Yes. Um, so these slides, everyone's welcome to use. And it's everything that we post, everyone's welcome to use. Um, and then, yeah, there's the whole guide and checklist for outreach and orientation events. It even says how to write press releases. I think the I think the thing that's really important is to just always be focused on why you're doing it. And um, it's easy for it's easy to get really wrapped up in nuts and bolts, and and um, and it's it's very important to to pay attention to those things. But um, as, no one's going to go with you there unless we get the compelling, you know, give the compelling reasons for a time bank. And um, I have tended to really find that it's really most helpful when you're approaching someone new, especially in an organization. I think it tends to be easiest for people to get their brain around if you can focus on one need and one asset that could be matched. So if I'm going to the utility company, for example, I might say, here's this one need. You need help getting people to this particular event. Here's one asset that you can provide to us in exchange for that. Um, you can give us an energy conservation kit. So um, it's just uh, I used to go to people with sort of the vision fully formed of how it would look completely integrated in their organization. And sometimes they loved that vision, but it was too overwhelming to think about how you would get from here to there. So I think those pieces are important, why you're doing it, and also helping keep it manageable for people. Great. And um you also mentioned, so you mentioned you launched in 2005, you've got 2,000 members, uh, individual members, 130 organizations, 60,000 hours, um, but you mentioned that people may only record a third of the hours that they've put in. So why is that? What does that mean? Does it suggest that there's a lack of full buy-in? Is it you know, they don't understand how to use the system? Are you actually saying they're, they're contributing more than they're putting in and they're just okay with that? Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I think it's a combination of all of the above. I think some people just really don't like going online and doing it. Some people just like to help out and not record their time. Um, so yeah, to me, that it doesn't really express a lack of buy-in. I think sometimes it's very positive um, where people develop enough of a relationship that they don't want to record their hours anymore, um, or it's just you know they would just rather help out and not record it. Um, yeah, but then there's definitely there are definitely the people who just don't want to go online and do it, and they are welcome to phone us and record them that way, but they just don't tend to. So um, I think that it's just the the nature of the informal economy. And actually, when before we started the time bank, I learned that that was a trend with time banks, and I was really alarmed by it. And then I realized, I mean, this was all part of our learning experience. Is if we're driven by the outcomes, and the goal of the outcomes are to connect people and with each other and with resources. So if if they are doing that and they don't want to quantify it, I think that's great. And especially if it's because they've developed enough of a relationship that they just help each other out. The way my friend put it was, if you come together to build a barn and you suddenly stop building a barn because it's finished, that doesn't mean you failed. So if we're rebuilding community, and, and rebuilding gift economies, it's it's fine. And and 
I don't want to encourage people not to record their time, but I don't want to discourage people from doing that if that's what they, if that's how they want to engage. And then for me, I just really view time making as a step toward where we need to go. I have no idea if where we ultimately need to go in our economy involves a system like time banking or not, but I think right now it fills a very excellent role and one that I don't see anything else filling because it's very good it's very good at making visible and rewarding and catalyzing exchanges of activities that tend to be marginalized and among people who tend to be marginalized in our economy currently. I think you just have started articulating what success looks like um, and how you talk about success. So if, for example, it's not just about number of members, number of participating organizations, and number of hours, um, but really it's about the relationships that get formed, how do, you, how do you know if you're being successful and how do you talk about that in a way that um, brings other people into the conversation and to participating locally, but also into creating more time banks other places? Well, we're working on it in a number of ways, and it's not it's not like a one simple, easy solution to that. But um, we had a student here doing an internship over the summer who developed a survey for our members that she's working on compiling right now. Um, but we're working on more qualitative outcomes. And because we're so project-oriented right there, we're measuring a lot of outcomes towards specific goals. So that part's kind of built in because we get contracts to carry out these projects, and then we have to measure you know, those concrete outcomes. Um, but for time making in general, actually that's part of the Build for the World project, is um, uh, my core partner on Build for the World is a PhD student, and what he's working on right now, I don't know if you want to pull up Build, just so people can see it, it's buildfpw.org, I don't know if that's a pain, but, um, but, my, uh, but the, the academic partner is working on developing um, more evaluation tools and um, and also developing and, and democratizing them so we can help push out um, good solid evaluation to other initiatives that are doing stuff. Yeah, so this is Build for the World that you're seeing and, and on the front page you're seeing the map of the different projects that are on here now. So this project in Kenya, the Sustainable Forestry Project, um, that's looking to take aid dollars and turn it into a community currency system that supports sustainable forestry. And then in Philadelphia, you'll see the Patch Adams Free Clinic. Oops, I clicked the wrong one. On ours, you'll see all our different projects. And then we've broken them down by project. So our time banking isn't on there as a whole thing, but our youth court's on there as one thing. And all the files that enable us to run a youth court um, are shared there. In LA, there's an artist bailout where they're getting together and doing crowdfunding stuff for unemployed artists and connecting them with the time bank. So just to give you some examples, and this is part of our philosophy that um, if people are working toward a common goal, um, that we don't want to be focused on the tools. We don't want to say, here's the right tool for this and this is how it has to be used. We feel that having a process where people are focused on what they want to accomplish and then use the tools to accomplish that goal, they'll figure out how to, what tool to use and how best to use it. Um, and this combined with our, and by our I mean our, the larger sharing economy community around the world, we need to really share as much as possible about what has worked and what hasn't worked and really learn from our failures as well as our successes and give people as much information as possible so they can identify what tool might work best or what tools might work best. Actually, and since you're looking at this page, this NIDA Network 90-Day Challenge, that is um, a pro this is this uh, little tiny representation. That is the project that we're working on to really create all this stuff to share. So there's no, yeah, there's not much on here at the moment, but but the knit, knit a network means knitting together a time bank network, and again, using a time bank as the process which helps you reach your goals, developing community yes. assets. Recognizing yes. community assets, connecting people to each other. Yeah, so and it's not just a time bank network, but it's a sharing economy network. So we have people from other mutual credit systems participating. And this is where we're um, going to uh, map out all the different softwares that are, are available and then what we need in order to link them well to make them work well, just to give you an example. Great. So we have some nuts and boltsy questions um, about um, Dane County Time Bank and others. Um, 
Is there a threshold number of participants um, that you think that really um, helps things be successful? Or can you start being successful with an initial 10 and then have proof of concept and build from there? Yes, uh, you can start. I think it's really you, you have no choice but to start small in anything. And I would say 10 to 20 is a fine place to start. And then at, it's very common for it to take, take a while for things to take off. And it's not just reaching critical mass in numbers. So the, I would say the factors are numbers of people, diversity of assets and needs. And that's really important to be targeting a few different groups of people at the same time so you don't have everyone with a similar set of assets and a similar set of needs. So those things, but then also just habit. Um, we're creatures of habit, and this is a new habit, and it's hard for people to get involved and choose to receive. So it's also common for a new group of time makers to all be givers, and then it's, you're stuck too because people have to choose to receive. So I would say the ways to make it go faster are for some of your initial groups to be committed to taking advantage of new offers and, and going out and hiring people for time bank hours to provide their services for you. Um, for us, I would say probably in our second year was when things started to flow much more fluidly. Um, again, though, we started on the earlier side of this. We started before the economic, most recent economic collapse. So I think that things are more ripe for things to happen more quickly. But that's my experience. I'd say you can start it with as few as 10. Be patient and do what you can to really help facilitate people giving by taking advantage of their services. And that how do you – that um, is always so important. And how, So how do people find out, and how do you bring them in? So do they um, find out about this from somebody who's providing a service? Do they go through a coordinator? You know, so there's kind of a two-parter here. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you market this so people know what it's about, and they get it, and they participate? And then once it's up and running, you know, how do, how do, what's, their, what's the angle in if I want to participate? So um, all of those things, actually. So because we have a lot of um, because we have a lot of human service providers in the time bank, a lot of them will refer people to the time bank when they don't have another option. Um, so and then we get the word out through the little neighborhood newspapers. Those are really effective. Word of mouth is most effective for us. Um, but we present at a lot of community gatherings. Um, yeah, so we, we edit, like there's a Northside Nonprofits Association, for example. So we'll go speak there. And then individual members, um, people can be connected with each other. They can either go on online and find the offers or requests and connect directly with the other members, or they can get in touch with us and we'll help coordinate them. We've also trained a lot of members who earn hours by being member coordinators. So other members will be listed as coordinators and they can get help connecting with people there. So it sounds like um, because you've, you've really emphasized that you're trying to involve everyone in a community, but in particular folks that may have been left behind um, you know, by the current economy, that folks need to be creative about how they actually spread the word. So word of mouth yeah. and local neighborhood associations, local neighborhood newspapers, it's not necessarily, you know, it might be a citywide listserv, it might be flyers, um, yeah. you know, it might be the main newspaper, but it sounds like there's also um, it's really important to go through kind of the smaller or um, neighborhood-based uh, communications channels as well. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we'll do as we build this training stuff is we'll build a media component in there. But it's really important to realize everyone communicates differently. When we get TV coverage, we get more homebound elderly people, which makes sense because they're homebound. So they're more likely to see us on TV, and that didn't occur to us till the first time we got TV coverage. Um, yeah, so everything, yeah, a diversity of approaches is what's going to get a diversity of response. Same with our events. Um, we try to have an event at least once a month to bring people together. And, and um, it's important with everything you do to be thinking of your next steps. So for example, we have an arts and crafts night. Um, not only do people get to do crafts there, some people sold artwork for Time Bank hours. We had a silent auction to benefit the Time Bank. Um, but then we also had people um, have their information for classes or workshops they would offer beyond that, and people could sign up for those. We have a pet parade. We have rock shows. Um, we've had bingo nights. So it's, you know, again, each one brings a really different audience.
Awesome. I, I'm going to see what we can do. We've got five minutes left, and I have maybe a minute of closing reminders. And I've got maybe three questions that we'll see if we can still get through. So to this question about do folks have to go through a coordinator, or how do they donate services, or how do they access services, it sounds like the website, from everything I'm hearing, is actually pretty key. But then if yep. folks don't have access to a website, how do they, uh, how do they deal with that? They call us and we help them, or they, or we set them up with an online buddy. Got it. So really, you have this online system, and you mentioned several of the free software uh, packages that are out there, and you know there's there's other options that you're pulling together with the Knit a Network initiative. But having some kind of system where you've got everything cataloged, all of what folks can give and what uh, they can uh, are seeking to receive, that's really important. And then if folks don't have web access, you pair them with somebody who can, or you help them through the phone. Yeah, and we would also like to make web kiosks around around the city too. I just pulled oh. up our actual Pine Bank site too, um, and that, so you can see upcoming events, and we have alerts for timely offers or requests, and then this whole give and receive page is where we have all the ads. Great. Now this could be a big question, but we've got a couple left, so uh, see what you can do with this. <laughs> um, Stephanie, uh, we had a question regarding the store, one of the stores that you mentioned. If somebody brought in a five-pound bag of apples, would you estimate the dollar value and then assign an equal amount of hours? So no. really to me this is a question about you know, how the time bank system matches up with our current money system. Yeah. And no, we don't. We try to keep it as separate from the dollar equivalent as possible. And it actually becomes pretty intuitive. I was I expected it to be more complicated, but it's it's not. Um, people just price it based on what feels fair, like how much of your life do you, should you trade for a bag of apples, or and or if the person grew the apples, they can think about what feels fair for the work that they put in. So um, we do have people exchanging produce and eggs and stuff, and they just do it based on what feels fair to both of them, and and do it based on time. Great. So, so in our store, we just had uh, we had experienced members come and price stuff out, and they just figured trade 15 minutes of your life for a pair of pants. You can get four clothing items for an hour, or four toiletries for an hour, or a set of dishes for an hour. So it just kind of came to the fairly simply. So how exactly to value things in an hour system versus a money system is something that an existing time bank has some experience on and could coach new time banks yes. through. Yes. Uh, so um, two remaining questions. How many paid staff do you have and how do you pay for them? And then I think there's a, any big challenges you might just point to that folks could be conscious of and maybe explore um, offline in a deeper way. It's the biggest challenge is money and sustainability. So sometimes banks do it all volunteer, and um, and like many organizations, have the initial burst of energy and enthusiasm, and then some burnout over time. So that's a challenge: leadership development, sustainability, and then um, so a lot of time banks find that paid staff are really helpful. We have a total of about three and a half full-time equivalent staff, but we're a big time bank with four youth courts, a wellness project, mobility projects, all the stuff that you just saw. So we accomplish a lot with not very many staff. Um, they're paid through, mostly through government contracts for us. So uh, the schools are paying us for youth court. The uh, Department of Human Services is paying for the disability stuff, et cetera. Um, and, but for a basic community time bank, usually Zero to one case staff can can pull it off, and um, sometimes banks charge member dues, and there are a number of models uh, for sustainability. No one's totally answered the question yet. Got it. Well, I think um, we've given folks a number of resources for uh, the nuts and bolts, but also linking into a community of folks who are thinking through these challenges and working through them and, and sharing resources and ideas, just as we do in our broader localist community here. So that's all wonderful to hear about. Um, any closing thoughts about other uh, time banks you would point folks to um, in the US or elsewhere that are, are great leaders and pioneers that are worth watching? Uh, visiting Nurses Service in New York does really cool stuff. There's a hospital-based time bank in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Hopefully you'll be able to read about all of these on Build soon. Um, but those are some good ones to start. There's a very interesting new one in Turkey, Z-U-M-B-A-R-A, Zumbara, I think. And I'll just type that in here, although they, their stuff isn't in English yet. 
Um, but it's a different kind of social media model. Got it. Well, and now there's Google Translate where you can help translate yeah. web pages. Well, um, I just want to remind everybody that after each webinar, we'll email everyone a link to this recorded webinar as well as the presentation materials and a copy of this chat window. So you'll get that in the next day or two. Uh, there were some formatting issues with Stephanie's slides which weren't her fault. They're just rendering with the <laughs> webinar platform. Um, but you'll get the correct version and a bunch of links embedded in her presentation in addition to all of the links in the chat window. Um, so watch for that. Um, we hope that folks will continue participating in these, um, these webinars every month. You can purchase them individually or you can buy three at a time for a significant savings. So all the details are at BeALocalist.org. And um, we like to keep these conversations going. So often we have questions we can't fully get to, and we have affinity groups or peer support groups that connect folks around um, areas of shared interest. So for Bali members, um, and, and, or anyone who would like to become a Bali member, we've got different levels of membership. We and continue these conversations via our, uh, our affinity groups offline. So thanks very much to everyone for your excellent questions. And Stephanie, thanks very much to you for sharing your time and expertise with all of us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right. Thanks, everyone.